What you're seeing right now is a project that I've been working on for more than a year now. On the left side, we have a server written in TypeScript where I'm updating the user type. And on the right side, we have a Rust client and a Dart client, both of which are being automatically updated as I make changes to the server. You see, the goal of this project was to create a web framework that allows for end-to-end -end type safety from the server to the client, regardless of what language is on either side. And I believe I've done that. Or at the very least, I believe I've created the foundations for that. This is Ari RPC, a code-first RPC framework. So for some context, you know, there's a lot of different frameworks for building web APIs. The most popular is REST, and then you've got some others like GraphQL and gRPC, and both GraphQL and gRPC, they use code generation in an attempt to give you that type safety you're hoping for. And then for those that are in the REST world, they have things like OpenAPI and Swagger to try and do the same. The common thread across a lot of these is that these are typically schema first, which is that you get this workflow where you write a schema in some kind of DSL, and then you run a code generation step. And typically that code generation will generate stuff for your client, it'll generate stuff for your server, and then you have to implement those things. In the case of GraphQL, there's actually a lot of different code generation that's happening because not only do you need to run code generation on your models, you also have to run code generation on any queries you do on the client. And it kind of becomes this mess where you're sort of writing code on the client and then you have a GraphQL code gen watcher that's watching your client code for any queries and then it generates those queries. Then you import the generated code and then you actually make the request. So this is a lot of code generation that's happening because you want that type safety. You don't want to think about serializing and deserializing these data structures and converting them between languages. You just want to be able to do it and not think about it, right? So as I said before, in something like protobuf, which is kind of what people think of when they think of RPC, you've got this proto file, then you run the protobuf compiler and it generates stubs for your clients and it generates skeletons for your server. It's kind of like it creates an interface and then you have to actually implement those interfaces. Now, the way that Ari is different is Ari takes, as I said before, a code first approach. So the workflow changes from this to something like this. And so the idea is that within your server code, you already have the type information. You have the information about where your routes are. So you should be able to generate your clients at build time. Now, Ari isn't the first project to explore this sort of code-first approach. For example, it's really common for people to use tooling and libraries that will automatically generate open API schemas from their server code. I've honestly never really been satisfied with open API. I feel like it's never quite gotten at the quality level that I want as far as the quality of the client goes. I've never really been satisfied and I could do a whole video just about that. But secondly, Ari was designed for this workflow from the ground up. The generation of this intermediate representation and the generation of your clients is all a part of the build process, which means you don't feel this middle step at all. This is honestly not that different, for example, in the JavaScript world, file-based routing is really popular. And when you use a framework that has a file-based router, you never really think about the fact that it's basically doing code generation to import all of these files and register the routes on the application, right? It's doing that. It's doing some kind of code generation to do that, but you never feel it. This is exactly what Ari is trying to accomplish but with clients in different languages. You update your server, you hit save, and the clients get updated. So let me show you what this looks like. Here I have a TypeScript implementation of RERPC. Right here, I have a procedure called say hello. And then here on the client, you see in the client, I'm calling say hello, and it accepts a name as one of its parameters, and it returns a message. So if I run this, 
you'll see that we print out hello John, which is what the server is returning. Now, if we update this, let's say we don't want to just accept a name, we want to accept a first name, and we want to accept a last name. And now let's update our message to also return the last name and hit save. Now you'll see here, immediately as I've hit save, my client is updated. I have a type error here on the right that needs to be updated. So let's do that. Let's add a first name and let's add a last name. And so now if I rerun it, it works as expected. Now you might be thinking, well, Josh, we already have stuff like this in TypeScript land, right? We have things like TRPC. We've got server functions and all these meta frameworks, they have stuff like this. Well, the difference is that RE is language agnostic. So I don't just have a TypeScript client. I also have a Dart client. And you see here, I have the same type error. And again, I didn't run another code generation step. I hit save and this is updated. So let's update our Dart client. And let's run this. And we get the same thing. Hello, John. I don't just have that either. I also have a Rust client and it has the same type error. And now let's run this. And there we go. And so here, I it's not, this is something that I, I've really been frustrated by, which is that I don't believe you need to have the same programming language on the server and client to get type safety. I don't believe that's the case. You have the type information at build time. So you should be able to convert it at build time to whatever language you're targeting, so long as you have some intermediate representation. By the way, it doesn't end here. So I showed you a TypeScript client, I showed you a Dart client, I showed you Rust. We also have, let's open up IntelliJ, and we've got a Kotlin client too. And we have the same error. So let's do this. And now we're gonna run it. And there we go. So here I am, again, I never ran a code generation step. I hit save on my server and it updated across all these clients. The same thing happens if I add another procedure. So let's add another one, say goodbye. So here I am, I've created a new procedure called say goodbye. And honestly, don't worry too much about what's going on here. In the TypeScript implementation, I've made it to where there's a file-based router because that's kind of a JavaScript-ism that's become very common. You don't have to do that, by the way. You can still define procedures like you would in something like Express, like this. Say hello, and you can define it here. Okay, so don't worry too much about that. These, the goal is that any RE implementation will follow the conventions of the target language. And so we've created a procedure called say goodbye. And now let's go to our Rust client. And then if we run this, you'll see that we log out hello John Doe and goodbye. Understand, I didn't even implement this new method. It was automatically generated. And so this is something that distinguishes Ari from maybe some other um, RPC frameworks, which is that Ari works over standard HTTP, similar to twerp by Twitch. It uses standard HTTP methods. Error codes get mapped to HTTP status codes. So really, I have created Ari, and the goals behind Ari is that I want it to be as simple to use as REST with the type safety you get from something like gRPC or GraphQL. So that means that we're not necessarily looking to be as performant as gRPC. This is a trade-off that I'm willing to make for simplicity's sake. Now, right now, I'm sending JSON over the wire. Theoretically, that type information is there. You could send a binary format if you wanted to, theoretically, right? But for simplicity's sake, I've implemented this with JSON. And now if we look at the server, let's talk about how this works really quickly. Here is our entry endpoint on the server, and we'll see that we have a schema path. And here we see we have an object containing all of our procedures. Every procedure has been mapped to a different URL, and every procedure 
specifies what HTTP method they're using. So theoretically, you can say, well, I want this to be put, I want it to be get, it doesn't matter. And that's another advantage that RERPC has over other RPC frameworks. We have access to get methods, which means that we can actually make use of the caching mechanisms that are built into browsers, which is not the case with GraphQL, it's not the case with gRPC, and it's not the case with JSONRPC. So every procedure gets mapped to a different URL and you specify what HTTP method it gets. The other thing too is that you just specify what parameters it receives and what response it receives. But you see here, in the TypeScript implementation, I have this type information available at runtime. Now, that doesn't have to be the case in, say, language XYZ, okay? They could make it to where, well, it just gets generated at build time and it's a compile step. The only goal is that we extract the type information and the information about our procedures at build time, and then we feed it to the RE code generator, and then we run it. So in our case, because the TypeScript server has a dev server, the dev server is just watching for changes and then it's sending stuff to the generator, which is how you get this effect of, oh, okay, I've got hot reload across TypeScript and Rust. It just works. So this in essence is what I'm going for with Ari, which is that you update the server, your clients get updated. The server is the source of truth for your type information. You're not writing separate schema files. You're not writing, you know, some big YAML file defining your open API specification. It lives in your code. And Ari has been designed around extracting type information from your server code and outputting to different kinds of clients. So now that we know that, let's talk about some of the things that Ari supports. So first of all, we support all these standard primitive types that you would expect. You get strings, booleans, timestamps, integers, even large integers like 64-bit integers. The specification has instructions about how to serialize them properly so that you don't get precision loss going to and from JavaScript, because let's face it, that's where the problems lie. We also support nullable types and optional types, objects, enums, arrays, discriminated unions, and recursive types. And actually those last two are something that I'm really excited about. And I could do a whole video about just that because Ari actually enables you to map out, you know, kind of these complex discriminated unions that can even be recursive. So let's say, for example, you have a tree of nodes that maybe you have a text node, you have a paragraph node that can have a child of other nodes, right? That are other text nodes and other things. Ari enables you to represent these recursive data structures that can be discriminated against. So in Rust, it'll generate an enum that you do a match statement against. In something like Kotlin or Dart, it'll create a sealed class that you do a uh, switch statement against or a, match, a when statement in Kotlin. These are data structures that are really trivial to represent in Ari's intermediate definition language. So these are all the types that are supported. Additionally, Ari supports unidirectional streaming with server sent events. We also have a plugin system for creating own generators. And it's basically, you just load in a function. It's really simple, much simpler than it is to creating plugins for other RPC systems. And I'll probably have my own separate video for that. In addition to that, we support currently a TypeScript client, Dart client, Rust client, and Kotlin. I'm also in the process of working on a Swift client, which means that in the coming months, basically you make an RE server, you'll be able to target basically all of the popular front end languages. And then sometime down the line, I would also like to get a Go client going and a Python client going. And when those are done, I think we'll have a pretty good spread as far as language diversity goes. In addition to this, currently I have just a TypeScript implementation. I would really like to have an implementation in one or more of these languages. I've really been looking at Go, Rust, Dart. I think when Dart gets its uh, static meta programming finished, when that becomes a thing, that's a really good use case for Ari. Rust, you've got things like proc macros and stuff like that. So honestly, I want a good balance of maybe easy to use languages and then um, higher performance languages on the server side and just make it really easy to have a first party implementation of those. 
In addition, anybody who wants to make their own server implementation, there is a guide that is available that I have put on the GitHub here. So if you go to the RERPC GitHub, you'll see there is a guide for implementing your own RE server. So honestly, if anybody's interested, maybe you have a language that you want to implement it in. Maybe you have some questions. I am all ears. I'm really open to getting more eyes on this. And this is kind of the main thing, which is that, so I've been using this in isolation for the past year. I would really like to get people trying it out, try it out, break it, really push it because there's obviously going to be some areas that I've overlooked as far as the structure of this system. So in order to do that, you can go over to the GitHub. This is github.com slash modimedia slash Ari. This is the Git repo right here. You'll see it's just me. And I actually don't know who this other person who started is, but thank you, random person. But this is the Git repo. You can get started with a TypeScript implementation. It'll give you everything you need to go to get a server running, start playing with it, start playing with the clients, and just let me know. I'm expecting people to break things, but I really think that this philosophy of code first APIs that are type safe, I think there really is something here. And this is the kind of workflow that I've honestly been really kind of wanting for. And I've been searching for it. You know, I've tried gRPC, I've tried GraphQL, REST with open APIs, and nothing's quite gotten that itch that I was looking for. And I'd, I just started working on it. I just started working on it. If you're interested, you want to try it out, I guess hit me up. You can find me here on this GitHub repo. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what people uh, make with uh, RERPC. So before I end, I want to give a couple shout outs here. So the first shout out I want to give is to this guy, Ulysses Carrion. I probably butchered that name. I don't know this guy, but Ulysses, he basically drafted a, an experimental specification called JSON type definition. JSON type definition is basically a way of defining data types in a language agnostic way. And this um, RE type definition, this thing here, is a superset of JSON type definition. I basically, I looked around for standards. I tried JSON schema. I was really close to making my own. And I came across this. I came across JSON type definition. And thankfully, Ulysses has laid a lot of the groundwork for things that I was trying to do. So it's not a one-to-one -one implementation of the JSON type definition specification. It does have some modifications, but I still have to shout him out because he laid a lot of the groundwork creating an intermediate representation for representing these data types. So thank you, Ulysses Carrion. Appreciate it. The second group of people I want to give a shout out to is actually the UnJS team. I made heavy use of this in creating the TypeScript implementation of an RE server. I made heavy use of this in creating the some of the tooling around RE. So shout out to UnJS. Shout out to Ulysses Carrion. And so the last thing that you might be wondering is RERPC. What is this name? Where did you get this name, Josh? Where did RE come from? And honestly, I don't know. I just kind of made it up. I liked how it sounded. And then I looked it up, it was available, that's it, right? There's no acronym, no fancy nothing. If you guys want to come up with something, be my guess. Maybe it's just a really, really incredible RPC framework. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, peace.